Um, I'm here presenting uh, with uh, Barry Norton, who is the development manager for Research Base, and Peter Hauser, who is from Fluid Ops, a company that um, produces the information workbench uh, software that we'll be looking at a little bit later. Um, but it's very good to be here because uh, the eResearch Centre uh, is the home of Claros, and Claros is one of the most significant one of the first significant applications that used uh, an ontology called, or uses an ontology called the CDOC CRM, and that's what we use in Research Base. Research Base is a collaborative uh, research environment uh, using uh, uh, knowledge representation and trying to harmonize data in a very meaningful and contextual way. And so what we've decided to do, because it's a very mixed audience, is I will be taking uh, the sort of non-technical slides. Barry will be uh, introducing research base and explaining what we're doing with the research based technology. And then Peter will be attempting to explain the technical aspects of Information Workbench and why it's so important for us to be using it. Uh, and that will become apparent um, as, as we go along. Um, so I, I, I'm going to start, uh, I think, um, with something from the 17th century. So research base uh, conceptually uh, has quite a history to it and museums themselves have uh, quite a history to the way in which we now eventually collect uh, and store data. This is uh, a Wunderkammer, uh, a cabinet of curiosity. And uh, these are both the same. This is Ole Wyman's Wormianum. And uh, what it's meant to do uh, it's allowed people to learn from the real world. It's about going out there and looking at nature. It's about understanding nature. Um, and it's about patterns and resemblances. It's a knowledge representation system uh, in society that allows us to take control and understand nature. And it's not comprehensive. It's very representative of things. It doesn't need to be comprehensive. The knowledge system is very simple. Um, sorry. Um, but it's gradually uh, augmented uh, in the future with archives and also uh, with books. Um, and these two things connect together. This is the Augsburg uh, Cabinet of Curiosity in the Getty Center. Uh, and these things will have resemblances. There's a network of resemblances and meaning across all of these cabinets of curiosity. And that's an important concept for us in, in research base because we're about knowledge representation. When we go into the 18th century, uh, the Enlightenment, uh, and this is where the British Museum, I'm from the British Museum, um, this is where the British Museum sort of comes in, this is Hans Sloane's collection, these are very comprehensive collections of objects brought together, natural and artificial, um, and they're asking very, very big questions, they're intersubjective, uh, they are going across cultures, they're going across periods, um, and uh, they are uh, very big questions that need very big collections to answer. And that is why uh, these collectors who are using the trade routes uh, and the expansion of, of the empire to, to uh, put these very comprehensive uh, collections together uh, and answer some, some uh, uh, interesting questions. But as we go through the 18th century and 19th century, we start to become more sophisticated in the way in which we look at um, uh, we look at these collections, they start to be more specialized. The classification systems become more scientific and uh, the, the collections start to split off. You get the South Kensington uh, museums uh, and other museums, the National Gallery, etc., who have their own classification systems. And that sense of unity that you got with, a digital, with the Wunderkammer starts to disappear and these things start to get separated. And that knowledge representation, the idea of knowledge representation across natural and artificial objects becomes separated as well. And here's some evidence of that from the 19th century. So uh, as we were going through that, that century, there were parliamentary committees, etc., examining the way in which we were uh, uh, storing or collecting and showing our collections. And these are some quotes. So Edmund Oldfield, assistant keeper of antiquities at the British Museum in 1857, is asked by a committee, is it an accident that the library, natural history specimens, sculptures, and antiquities were part of the same institution? And he thinks it is. It's an accident, but it wasn't an accident. It was, it was, uh, it was a, a, a development from the original, uh, original uh, Wunderkammer's, the Cabinets of Curiosity. So that history of why the collection has been put together is already starting to be lost in history. Um, 
so I've got a slight problem with these slides. And there's another quote, or not a quote, but this is uh, Panzini, the, the principal librarian of the British Museum, asserting a distinction between Christian art and heathen antiquity. So this argument that's going along about how you separate out objects uh, and where they should be uh, displayed and where they should be managed um, is happening all the time. The National Gallery is asserting that actually some of these classical art objects should be part of the National Gallery. And the British Museum is saying, no, they shouldn't. They should be part of the, the British Museum. They're classical and they're part of our, our collection. So the, these arguments are going on. The important point is we start to forget about the reason why these things were put together in the first first place. And when we, the problem is that when we start uh, talking about uh, the open world, so we collect uh, data about these objects and put them in internal systems which are designed just for us, but when we start putting them out into the open world, we start having problems because the way we've stored them and the design around the way in which we've stored the data and knowledge was never designed for an open internet web world. And what we produce, uh, as Willard McCarty says here, are just reference uh, uh, servers, knowledge deep boxes, extremely useful, but they have no context to them. Because the data we're collecting, because of that classification system, because those specializations that we put into the data mean that we have incomplete, uh, are incomplete and sub insubstantial. The universal of particulars, as Bertrand Russell put, uh, they, 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 they seem to demand a context before anything can be done with them. So we, we're reaching a point where those classification systems are becoming an impediment to what we're doing on the web and, and stopping us from doing some very sophisticated modeling when we bring uh, data together from these different institutions. Uh, and this is an important uh, concept for research base. However, museums still have perspective. Um, so regardless of the fact that we've split off and we've created our own classification systems, um, doesn't mean that we have, uh, have the same uh, homogenous way of looking at things. And our classification systems still inherit, they still embed certain aspects of our organizations, which are about their locations, which are about the disciplines within the organization itself, uh, which are about all sorts of regional aspects, about our languages. And so as you go across the world, there'll be different ways in which these classifications of systems are used in different vocabularies. And this is an example um, from a, a famous museologist. Um, a silver teaspoon made in the 18th century in Sheffield will be classified as industrial art in Birmingham City Museum, decorative art at Stokeham Trent, silver at the Victoria and Albert Museum, and industry at Callum Island. So, so even the same objects have slightly different perspectives depending on where, where you're coming from, what your disciplines are, and what your organization is. And again, this is an important aspect because while we haven't got context to objects at the moment, we have these perspectives which are very interesting because a lot about history is about context and perspectives and putting these things together. And this, this has some bearing uh, on, on the way that we look at the, 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 the data and what we can do in the open world, as I said. This is a, um, uh, Ovid's uh, Metamorphoses, which I put up there because it's one of the early examples of modeling um, source materials. Uh, it's from uh, Toronto or King, and King's College in London. And this is about modeling uh, this literature uh, in such a way that you bring in context. You can, you can get a feel, you can get a feel, a sense of the atmosphere throughout the book. You can sense when a particular character comes into the literature, not just from their name, but from the context and the adjectives that are being used. And this is quite a, an interesting uh, example of the way in which these things, these, these closed and discrete things can be modeled. And in it, they use very uh, scientific techniques, so transparency, reproducibility, control, provenance, and context. Con this is the thing that you can get from these very discrete projects. It's not the same in the open world, though. And we have these technologies called linked data uh, and uh, uh, what's called the semantic web. Uh, but linked data itself is not, not enough. Uh, this, is a, this has actually come from uh, one of David's articles saying, why is linked data not enough for scientists? Well, there are lots of reasons. One, because it's very, very difficult to replicate this type of thing uh, when you come out into a, a more comprehensive and collaborative environment, but also because uh, a lot of the context is lost when we actually publish to this environment in the first place. And what we're trying to do, actually, is get back to some of the ideals of the Wunderkammer. We're trying to get back to a knowledge representation system of the real world. 
uh, we are trying to use knowledge representation, which is a way of representing real world things in a way that can be interpreted by computers. And we're using an ontology called the conceptual reference model to inject knowledge back into the data. All of the stuff that we took out of our universal uh, particulars, we're trying to put out the context. So when we publish data, we actually go back to the people who know and own and understand uh, this data and try and inject some context back into it so that when we put it out onto the web uh, we can have some context there and we can use that to harmonize data but also we can uh, make sure that this is linked back to the provenance uh, from the original sources as well. And this is extremely important. This, I just put this up because this is uh, an example of the way in which computers um, do, do sort of generally deal with data. This is actually from Hitchhiker's Guide from the Galaxy. This is Deep Thought, the supercomputer that took uh, millions of years to, to, uh, to mull over the question of life, the universe and everything and came up with the answer 42. Um, and in our, our internet world, of course, we can, we can put that uh, question into to Google and it will take milliseconds to come back, but with millions of answers. Uh, and that's part of the, the problem we're trying to solve as well. How do we get back uh, decent precision and recall using some of this meaning and context? So what I'm, what I'm going to do now is give you an example and a very non-technical example of how museums provide context and potentially stories and actually help research and help historians. And this is a very odd example. <laughs> um, this is a, uh, a statue that used to be in the uh, square in a town called Lowestoft, uh, which is my hometown. So I have a habit of whenever I go into a uh, whenever I go into a an online collection system, whatever a museum it is, or archives, or whatever, or library, I don't search for a thing. I search for a place, and I search in my hometown. I want to know what it will tell me about my hometown. This is a terrible. Um, statue. Um, it's actually been moved to a car park at, uh, in Asda, I think, well away from the... Um, it was never liked by the locals, um, but it's meant to be pointing to, to the uh, fishing port, which is what Lostoff is, is partly famous for, but it's famous for lots of other things as well. It's actually situated here on the East Coast. You always see it on the weather maps when you, you look at the BBC weather, because it's the most easterly point in Great Britain. That's its claim to fame. But essentially, it's a sort of dead, dead fishing town. The fishing industry uh, stopped in, in, uh, uh, in the 2000s. So this came about as a result of having to do a presentation uh, in Edinburgh, and I wanted to try and make some points about their collection system. This is when uh, we were just about to have uh, the, the referendum in Scotland, and I wanted to see whether there were any connections between my hometown and what was in uh, the Museum of Scotland's collection systems. And I found a few bits and pieces. This is this plate, a particular type of plate that's used in Scotland, but it was actually made uh, in, in Lowestoft and uh, decorated in, in Glasgow. And then these are these model boats. Uh, and the interesting thing is this one here, uh, which I'll come back to, this is the Star of Scotland. It's a, if you're into fishing industry, it's a significant boat because um, it was the first boat that actually gave uh, fishermen some decent accommodation so they could go out into to the waters of the North Sea for longer, longer periods. This is uh, a manual to Lowestoft from 1849. Um, and you can see that Lostoff was, uh, at, at some point, quite an, an important place. Lostoff is not only considered a very healthy and pleasant watering place, but from various causes is assuming a position of such importance as to render it more than probable that visitors will arrive in numbers, augmented every season. Uh, so, so Lostoff has potentially a lot of things to it that people would want to visit. Um, it was the site, the earliest site of human habitation in Britain. Just up the coast is Dunwich, which used to be considered the capital of England. Uh, it had Roman settlements, uh, settled by the Danes in the 19th, uh, 9th century after killing the king of East Angles. Uh, many important uh, naval battles, uh, an important fishing town since the, the Middle Ages, so it's a, a significant thing when uh, the fishing industry stopped there. And if you go into Wikipedia, you'll notice that there are some important uh, Premier League footballers, etc., etc. So there's all sorts of bits and pieces about, about Lowestoft. When we go to museums, 
we see that uh, you pick up on, on bits and pieces like this. This is from the National Railway Museum. This is a train coming into Lowestoft picking up, picking up the fish. This train was actually instrumental in more and more visitor figures coming into to Lowestoft. It used to be a, a famous Victorian spa town as well. The Victorians used to love going to, to Lowestoft. It had a fantastic beach and uh, bracing waters. And this is the British Museum. So when you put Lowestoft into the British Museum collections online, you get Lowestoft porcelain. Uh, and Lowestoft porcelain uh, produced in the 18th century, uh, fine porcelain, um, and uh, you find this almost everywhere. Also in the British Museum, you get prints and drawings uh, based on the work of people like Turner. So the, the Suffolk coast is a, a, an interesting subject area for a lot of artists. Um, so those interested in art history will find lots and lots of examples of drawings and prints by people, artists, famous artists, who, who came down to Suffolk and Lowestoft and, and, and uh, uh, drew scenes there and landscapes. If you go to the Tate, you find that these things are combined. So here's a piece of Lowestoft porcelain. And it's in a painting. Uh, obviously, the Tate have other things, uh, Turners as well, which originate uh, from scenes from, from Lowestoft in Suffolk. But you start to see some connections between the two things, porcelain and, uh, and these paintings. If you go to Sweden, you find that this Lowestoft porcelain actually uh, uh, is traveling around quite, quite a lot. So they have uh, Lowestoft porcelain as well. And you find also that the Rijksmuseum um, they have interesting things about uh, Lowestoft. So this is the Battle of Lowestoft, um, 1665. 109 ships on the uh, English side, 103 on the Dutch side. This is a massive battle um, off the coast of Lowestoft. If you were standing on the cliffs of Lowestoft, you would be amazed at, at uh, what was actually going on. And there's huge numbers of paintings that are related uh, to that event. Uh, and, and this is a very significant event, 500 people killed, 2,000 taken prisoner. This is happening off the coast of Lowestoft. If you go to New York Metropolitan, they also have Lowestoft porcelain. They also have paintings of people who originated from Lowestoft. So you start to build up this picture that Lowestoft um, actually was part of a, a, a bigger scene than it is uh, nowadays. And of course, Suffolk was a very rich county in Britain uh, and uh, home of, for example, many plantation owners who used to own some of the, um, the wealth in, in other countries. The National Maritime Museum perspective. These are boats, so uh, obviously Lowestoft being on the coast will have a, 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 a uh, a maritime history. These are medals that commemorate the Battle of Lowestoft. These are, start, these are different objects that have uh, a, a, a different place in that, that history as well. Articles as well about uh, the Battle of Lowestoft. And when you come back to this boat, uh, it turns out that this boat, which is model here, actually uh, the real thing uh, ended up in Lowestoft. It ended up in the fleet in Lowestoft um, and was renamed the Jamaica. And there it is, and there were paintings of it. Uh, and this is it in, in Lowestoft uh, Port, still called the Star of Scotland there, uh, but renamed when it goes to Lowestoft. This is Aberdeen Regional Museum. Huge amounts of information about this one boat. The schematics, its history, when it was repaired, when it got renamed to Jamaica in 1960. And here it is again in Lowestoft, uh, renamed now, an LT emblem here. And it turns out my dad uh, was uh, man managing a, uh, an engineering company in Lowestoft, uh, uh, managing the repairs of the whole fleet, and he worked on this boat. He stood on it, and actually lots of people got rides up and down the coast on this boat. So you start getting into social history. So Lowestoft in Scotland, what's the, the, the connection here? Well, there may be quite a few. There was a, in the fishing trade, there was a migration of people down from Shetland all the way down to Lowestoft. Lots of people from Scotland uh, settled in East Anglia. So there is a massive connection between uh, uh, Scotland and East Anglia. Although I was um, listening to a radio program just before the referendum, and they were talking to people in Essex and they were saying, what, what, what do you think of the referendum? They were saying, well, there's, there's no connection with Scotland at all. There's no connection between us. What? They should just go independent. In fact, there's masses of, of connections. So this person here saw a lot of the world. When she says a lot of the world, I went to Lowick, Stonze, Lock Maddy, Yarmouth, Lowestoft, Peterhead and Fraserburgh. 
These are herring girls who are working in this industry, working very hard, uh, and there's a whole social history, and there are museums all the way up the coast of Great Britain that uh, uh, have material about this sort of stuff. Going back to, to art, uh, this is uh, from the National Gallery in Washington. This is a muirhead bone of the port of Rostovt. So you start to wonder why, why, why is muirhead bone uh, during, during the port of, of Lostoft. This is a pub that's opened up in Lostoft. This is where that fisherman statue used to be. Uh, and this pub is open. It's a Witherspoons pub. And no one in Lostoft could understand why they called the pub the Joseph Conrad. Um, and I, I suspect a lot of people still don't know why. Well, it's because Lostoft uh, was the home of Joseph Conrad, where he learnt English. So Lostoft starts to become even more prominent uh, in, in terms of these archives and the museum perspectives that I provide. He says, uh, I landed in Lostoft on the East Coast, knowing no one. These are his own memoirs. My first English reading was the standard newspaper, and my first acquaintance by the ear with it was the speech of fishermen. He learns his trade. This is where he starts to get into the merchant se seamanship. And um, I think it's from Tilbury in Essex that he, he sets off to um, the Congo where um, the inspiration for Heart of Darkness. So you can see the connection starting, starting to come together. So what's the connection with Muirhead Bone? Well, he meets Muirhead Bone in Lostoft, and, he, and Muirhead Bone does these drawings of Joseph Conrad. They become friends. And there's a history around this as well. And these are in the British Museum. There's also Muirhead Bones, for example, in the Tate. So this picture here, if I do a bigger version of it, it's the Rand Reading Room of the British Museum. It's the Muirhead Bone. But the point is that there are no connections between any of these museums, archives, and galleries to make these connections together. I'm doing this manually. This is taking me a huge amount of time. And that is the point. It took ages, even with the web. And I think we're putting the, the, the proposition forward that this should be instantaneous. This should be very easy. We should have found these relationships very, very easily. Um, and we all have this data embedded into our collection systems. It's a mine of information. And we're publishing it in such a way that we cannot get this context. We cannot make those connections. But it is all sitting there. And so what we've done is we've converted our data over to use these relationships. So some people are familiar with this schematic. It's not important. It actually isn't very complicated. It seems complicated. If you saw the, the relational data model for this, it's much more complicated. But these are mapping out the relationships within these objects. And you can probably just about see that there are different parts of this. They have different context. There's biographical information. There's bibliographical information. There's collection uh, rights. There's materials, acquisitions. All of these, if you separate them out, are meaningless. But as a whole, they provide context for each other. And that is the important thing about what we're doing with the CDOC CRM. We are utilizing all of this context to give us these different perspectives. And what happens is we can start doing this. We can start taking the entities within that data. It doesn't matter whether it's the object or the actor or the place or the event or the time or the category. And we can create a matrix of relationships across these things, which are much more sophisticated than any collection online system, and actually can start helping research environments. We can start using the power of computers to start interpreting some of this stuff and bring to the fore research questions that maybe we've never thought of before. So the CDOC CRM has lots of relationships that we use. Um, I think there are over 100 of them. And we um, abstract them down. To, to, again, this is the same matrix, but with the relationships here. So a thing uh, refers to a place, or uh, a thing um, is from an event. It's created from an event, or it was destroyed in an event. And these are all matrices that we're building into these, these systems that give us much more control, much more precision, and much more context and meaning so that we can answer some of the questions um, that we get asked as part of our research. And this is a schematic of the system. We, we have a working prototype of research base already that uses data from uh, Yale, Centre for British Art, the British Museum, the RKD in, in Holland. Uh, and it uses a contextual search system that concentrates on things. But we're actually producing now a, a search system that allows you to say, I don't want to start with a thing. I want to start with a person. 
and I want to use the results of that to look for events and I want to use the results from that to find places and maybe then I want to look at the things that result from that so I can skip around all of these different entities with those contextual relationships and I'm not fixed to any linear route and this is where I'm, I'm going to stop this is meant to be a sort of non-technical introduction to the stuff that's coming up <laughs> um, but this is research based that allows you to, to do annotations we, we're trying to build in argument and belief using these contextual relationships this is very important for, for research that we can not just annotate things not just stick things on the end of things but we actually produce assertions that are graphs themselves in the data that have the same relationships as the source assertions and this is extremely important uh, and there's some other bits and pieces here that Barry will talk about. Um, but that's my bit ended. Thank you. So um, a quick word of self-introduction, as I was asked to do. Um, indeed, I've been, uh, I joined the museum um, full time, although I've been a little bit involved with research base previously to that, uh, a year ago. Um, before that, um, my research career was a computer science one. Um, so, I have a computer science PhD and postdoc work in semantic web and linked data. Um, not humanities, I'm, I'm learning. <laughs> and learning hopefully how to, uh, to communicate in this uh, bridge between these two things, this um, semi-technical way. Um, I hope I'm not too technical. Um, nor too ignorant about the, <laughs> about the domain, because what I thought I'd do is pick up one particular example of uh, research-led um, um, work um, which has been supported by the research based platform already. Um, so even though we're at this stage of development between um, a prototype that's been available since last year and moving into developing a production system um, for other museums, um, we're already supporting um, especially in, in, think, in work that's related to the British Museum, um, several, several uh, people pursuing research questions using the data and using the tools. Um, so one such um, considers the, um, the B Egyptian Book of the Dead. Um, perhaps don't need to explain, certainly to some people in the audience who are talking to me about Egyptology already, um, that these are a, a set of uh, uh, funerary um, texts, um, that they were rendered primarily onto um, papyri, but also on linens um, as, part, as part of burial. Um, they have both text in, uh, in these cases in, in one or two scripts in hieroglyphic or hieratic, but they also have vignettes um, to illustrate um, this codified set of steps um, that mixes uh, mythology and practical steps for, for burying and preserving the dead. Um, an important point here about um, making, making links the way that Dominic was talking about is um, with some subjectivity one can group um, the surviving remnants, the surviving manifestations of the Book of the Dead into different traditions um, based on timing, based on geography uh, and these are kind of schools of, of craftsmen who were producing these, um, these linens and the papyri um, for burials. Um, I also went to the web very quickly, as one does, looked up the Book of the Dead, and it says, uh, quite rightly, to start with, there's no one canonical Book of the Dead. Um, there's no concrete thing. What we have is all of these different manifestations that vary from one another. In fact, they vary in the text, and they vary in the way that those are rendered into, into vignettes, uh, graphically. Um, so, the work that we're supporting um, is um, a digital edition of the manuscript of uh, Malcolm Mosher, um, who in his first volume, the one that we've been tackling so far, looks at spells 1 to 16 and does this uh, grouping uh, for, for each spell into a set of versions that represents um, a different uh, uh, variant, a different tradition. Now these number of versions um, change between spells, um, but each one, each version, is fixed to some objects that have been used in composite to produce that common translation. 
um, which is Moshe's modern translation. Um, so what we have um, in the manuscript as it exists is spells 1 to 16 in several versions for each spell and a pointer to objects that were used to reconstruct each version. Those objects are primarily at the British Museum, at the Louvre, and at the Getty. Um, so we want to do something with this text that's more interesting as a digital resource. Um, I, uh, I will ignore my joke about Malcolm, ignore my self-reference. <laughs> uh, to skip forward, because I should be quick, uh, I don't want to tell you much about the technology here at all, apart from to introduce some acronyms. We publish our collection, or at least a large part of it, online as linked data, and the acronym to know if you don't know it, some people will know it well in the room, some people perhaps not at all, is using RDF as a data model. Um, it's a web compliant model for data where we can make new links between things, as the name linked data suggests. So yeah, we publish these things, uh, each of our objects. We allow people to make queries over the top of our data using second acronym, with apologies, Sparkle. So the QL is the query language. So just a quick example of the kind of queries that anyone can come to our website and make across the British Museum data is uh, tell me how many book of the dead objects you have or more with more complexity. Tell me what the material composition of your book of the dead objects is. So we can quantify this idea that uh, most of them are papyrus, uh, about a tenth of those are linen, and there's many other interesting uh, materials that are used in the construction of the things that we have uh, as preserved, as, as remaining manifestations. Um, we don't just describe objects, okay? Our linked data exposes our um, internal authorities for things like the Egyptian gods. Um, so we give Last acronym, I think, well, abbreviation, URI, acronym if I say URI, but I dislike doing that. Um, a a web-based identifier is given to, for instance, the god Osiris, okay, and many other gods. We also expose things like uh, the materials. All of, the, all of our materials authority, each, each, at each level, is given a URI, and other people can understand what we mean by them, perhaps reuse them, or perhaps map them against their terminologies at a, from a different institution. And indeed, that will be part of the work of research base. Um, one, to help people map their data into RDF at all and into the CRM ontology. Two, to stop making alignments between terminology. Um, but what we do with um, these things, so the objects and the gods, um, we have some relationships like this, and this is the easiest way, hopefully, to understand both RDF and CRM. RDF just lets you, having identified things, so objects and more abstract things, so a physical statue and the god as a shared idea, having identified them, we can make relationships between the two. And CRM guides us on what relationships we might want to use and have a shared understanding of what the relationship is, like this depicts one. Um, and it gives us uh, classes, um, ways to group our resources together and understand that they all share something in common. Um, so here, man-made object is a class, person, arguably for a god, uh, is, a, is a good classification. Um, and we have the depicts relationship. This whole diagram that Dominic showed that was an incredibly complex graph breaks down just into these things, into relationships between things that we might understand by their grouping into classes. Um, so we have some of these, and ResearchBase will let you search using those where they exist to find conditions, uh, so, sorry, to find connections, the way that Dominic was talking about. But it will also support creating new connections, and that's what Malcolm had done in his book. Uh, he took objects that are 
already described and uh, concepts that already exist, like the gods, like the materials used uh, during burial, and made new connections, which are the grouping of the spell into traditions and the assignment of each object that he considered into a tradition according to its textual nature as a spell. So there is the rich model, but don't worry, it's no more difficult than that one simple arc, just quite a few of them. Um, so the project with the Book of the Dead is to be able to model all of these things. Um, the concept of the Book of the Dead as an, as an abstract thing, um, although abstract, it can be decomposed, and this has been systematized for, for uh, a, long, a long time in studying Egyptology, into numbered and agreed spells, uh, not all of which will be present on any one object, but there's a, you know, a canonical list of spells. Uh, and the vignettes, we want to model Moshe's volume uh, his, uh, in itself and the information inside it, which is grouping of spells into, spells into versions according to tradition and objects that are related through expressing those versions or manifesting those versions, sorry. Um, so not to complicate things, but we bring in another ontology called Ferberu, which sits alongside CRM and lets us talk about things like one thing deriving from another as an expression or an object manifesting an expression uh, and build a model for that kind of thing. Now, I don't mean to talk through the model at all. Again, it's just a big complicated graph. What I want to do is show quickly from the research-based prototype um, some of the things that we aim to abstract away from all of that detail and give tools for finding and building new connections and then hand over to Peter who's going to talk about how we take basically the technology that we'll use to take this prototype work into a production system which is more open, more reusable and uh, that people can adopt parts of if they'd like to rather than using the whole platform. Um, so all, all of that was built on this RDF data model and Sparkle querying over it, but nobody using the research-based prototype or the production system will have to know that it's RDF, will have to ever write any Sparkle. So to start with for finding connections, uh, we have a search system um, that one understands terminologies and people and places. Um, relative to one's own as a user research project. So each research project can say it's these collections and these terminologies that our project will concern itself with. When I search, I want to search for those objects using those terminologies. Um, so you see, for instance, here, if I put in Osiris, I'm told there is a, um, the, the top thing in the drop down that I can choose is that the British Museum have a person, actually person institution, but, um, but there are other kinds of things that I might be picking. I might be talking about the Temple of Osiris, um, which is a place. Um, again, each institution might have different terminologies and or you might have mappings between them. Um, so it doesn't happen with Egyptian at the moment, but it happens strongly with Rembrandt. Dominic was talking about the RKD before, that there are Rembrandt-related things where you'll see multiple institutions already aligned. So if you pick something, Rembrandt himself, for instance, is an instance that's common across both the museum and Yale and RKD. Um, so in the search system, I can pick up my terminologies and I can use these fundamental relations, these relations that are abstracted from the RDF that Dominic was talking about. Okay? So I don't need to know all of these P numbers that represent all of the arrows on Dominic's big diagram. I just, need, I just get a friendlier list of folded up, of abstracted relations in that graph that I can search on and then investigate. So I can look for well, it wouldn't make much sense created by Osiris, arguably in the real world, um, but about Osiris. Um, we'll cover him being depicted 
but also mentioned in text. So it's this kind of abstraction. So this search system will let me do things like, here the search is about Osiris and made of papyrus. Okay, so I've used both the material and the subject to do this search. And underneath the hood, executed a Sparkle query and used it to find pictures and descriptions, but I never touched that. I just know my terminology uh, and which terminologies I've also included in my project and ma matched against. Um, we have a tool um, for, we call it data annotation at the moment, but it's going to extend beyond this, where I can look at the data in this case, the canonical data in the sense that it was asserted by the British Museum about a British Museum object. And I can question things like, do I have it on this slide? Yeah. Uh, there's a depiction of Osiris. Um, I can go in as a research base user and question that, say I don't believe it represents Osiris. Instead, I think it's Ra. Okay. Now, an important part of research base is one, that I can make new connections, but two, my assertions are recorded together with the provenance of who said so, when, as part of, as part of which project. And they're a separate thing, obviously, from the canonical information from the object owner. Okay? There's also the possibility to uh, later, it's not something that we have at the moment, but it's in the plan, um, to publish your assertions, which will be a subset of, of these. Um, the idea is to support discourse within a project on this basis. So if I make an assertion, I'll start a communication within the project where they can point at this, um, I can introduce, using an argument and belief ontology, what evidence I believe there is for this, comparison with another object, the use of um, a picture or some particular kind of imaging against the object, a reference to an academic work. Okay? And once I've recorded that, then other people within the project can discuss this and eventually reach a conclusion such that the project in the end will either accept this assertion or reject it and can publish the accepted assertions with the whole discourse, how we decided that this was true. Um, image annotation, worth mentioning, because I have to get back home and do some of this, actually, <laughs> against these very resources. Um, so we have a tool already where I can go and draw a geometry. I was lazy here and just chose a rectangle, but I could do something much more detailed. And again, link that up to the terminology. So I say that represents Osiris. Um, that's something that we're working on uh, right now, um, using the tooling. Um, the original subject of my talk, but I think I'll hand over to Peter rather than tell you any details about it, is also to look through the text of their translations. Um, so the English translations of these different versions of the Book of the Dead spells, we use the same linked data from the research-based system to go through the text and, and at least now mark up the gods when they're explicitly named. And uh, we're working on automatically annotating the places and automatically annotating the materials, um, which when it comes to the, the actual practical steps about burial become really important. What kind of objects have to be buried with the dead um, to give them a successful transfer into the afterlife? Um, so by taking the texts and annotating the text the way we annotate images with mention of all of these different things from terminology and people list and places list. We find more connections again between these different, these different objects that have the relationship to the text in Moshe's volume. So right now there's a lot of data about that and very soon when we have a, our new user interface uh, uh, role on the team, we'll have a, a website, website to actually show how this is turned into a, a, a consumable digital edition. Um, so in order to transition to Peter, I should explain, um, especially uh, with the information workbench, this, this search system was used as a proof of concept of adopting the information workbench as a core platform to build the production version of Research Space over. So we took this component for searching based on fundamental relationships and terminologies 
and redeveloped it as an open source component for the information workbench. So already anybody can take the basis of this search system and use it open source across any data. Okay? It's particularly nice with CRM, but one could use it for anything at all. And this is what we plan to do in, in now developing um, the open and the production version of research base is take each of our components and make it a separable, separatable, um, um, open source component on top of this platform. Um, so we become just one application of those components using the platform. So I'll pass over to Peter. Okay, uh, so my name is uh, Peter Hase. Uh, I'm one of the people behind the information workbench. Actually, I, over the last five years, I led the development uh, of the information workbench. And so th this talk is about uh, yeah, technology and tooling to enable the kind of applications that, uh, that Barry talked about. Yeah? So what I will do is uh, uh, tell you a little bit about the information workbench in general as a platform for building uh, linked data applications but also show you how to yeah, rapidly create uh, applications in the domain of uh, cultural uh, heritage. Uh, so I uh, show a little bit about uh, of this proof of concept project that, uh, that Barry mentioned uh, about the British Museum. But uh, what I also did um, just last week, I got, got a hold of this uh, Claros data set from the uh, uh, Claros project. Uh, that was developed uh, here in this very institute. And yeah, I, I spent a couple of hours to uh, build like a small demo application just to illustrate the kind of applications uh, that can be built with this platform. Yeah? Uh, so what is the information workbench? It's, yeah, as I said, a platform for building linked data applications. And there I mean really all aspects of uh, yeah, interacting with linked data. Yeah? So both on the side of supporting uh, data publishers, yeah? creating linked data, as well as on the consumption side. Yeah? Um, so important aspects in this context are uh, integration of data. Yeah? Uh, which can be private as well as public data sources. We, we also do a lot of work in the, in the space of uh, enterprise uh, linked data integration. Yeah, so it can be uh, private, open uh, uh, data sources. And we have uh, very flexible mechanisms to also uh, get legacy data sources uh, into this uh, linked data cloud, yeah, transforming legacy data, for example, from relational databases, from XML databases, from spreadsheets, uh, publishing them uh, as, uh, as RDF data, interrelating them, and so on. Uh, the platform also supports means for uh, yeah, end user oriented uh, data access and analytics, which includes uh, aspects of semantic search, visualization, exploration, supporting uh, analytical tasks and predictive analytics, etc. Uh, on the end user side, uh, we have a very flexible uh, yeah, UI mechanism that uh, allows to really rapidly and completely declaratively build uh, end user oriented interfaces uh, uh, for the linked data. You will see that in, uh, uh, in, in the live demo later on. But the platform does not only support surfacing the data, but also aspects of uh, yeah, creating, authoring the data, and supporting collaborative workflows around the data. Yeah? So some of the, uh, these uh, workflows Barry already mentioned, yeah? so for example, supporting uh, collaborative annotations, discussions uh, uh, around particular artifacts, and so on. Uh, so all of these aspects are uh, supported by this platform. Uh, yeah, what I should also say, and that is uh, very important, it's uh, completely built on open standards and, uh, and technology, so I'm not going to explain all these uh, standards in detail. Barry mentioned some of them. Uh, RDF as the underlying data models, Bark as query language, OWL as the, the ontology language. Uh, it's also open in, uh, in the sense that we have a, an open source version, community edition of the platform, but we are uh, also uh, we also provide uh, an enterprise edition for commercial applications. So uh, without going into too much te technical detail, just a very high level overview of the uh, information workbench architecture. Uh, basically what, what you see here is uh, at the very core, our platform where we operate uh, with the semantic triple store, uh, basically an RDF database that, uh, where the data is managed. And that triple store can be populated or can connect to any kind of data sources, which may be uh, open data sources, for, for example, from the linked open data cloud, but also other data, open data sources, may also be private or enterprise data sources. Yeah, and with our technology, we're able to integrate all of this data, interrelate that, uh, et cetera. Uh, so part of the platform then are also components for 
Yeah, so I think the, the data through a semantic wiki engine that will explain workflow engine, components for such analytics and so on. So there's there are a lot of components uh, that we provide basically out of the box, but uh, I mentioned information workbench is also really a platform for building applications, so it's very easy to uh, build uh, custom applications for such uh, use cases, application domains, and so on. And that we support uh, via what we call uh, SDK, Solution Development Kit. Here you see some of the elements of such a uh, development, uh, of this development kit at the very core. We have the an ontology that basically describes the domain of the application that, uh, uh, that you want to use. For example, cultural heritage via the CRM ontology. Uh, parts of this are also components to connect to particular data sources. Uh, then, as you will see, uh, templates for building uh, or for surface, surfacing the data on the, on the user interface side, where in these templates you can uh, embed uh, rich widgets for interacting with the data, etc. Uh, all of these components are comp can be configured completely decla declaratively, yeah? so this really enables to build custom solutions uh, without programming. Yeah? And yeah, as I said, these applications can be in arbitrary application domains. So you see some examples of uh, music, media, cultural heritage, uh, and so on. Yeah? And uh, it's really very easy to develop uh, your own solutions with this platform. Uh, so with this demo application that I will just show, I basically did exactly that. Yeah, I used our uh, solution development kit to really just, in, in a couple of hours, build something uh, very small where, where, where we can see what, what, what is really uh, possible uh, also very rapidly. So uh, here are the elements that I used uh, as an ontology. I used the uh, uh, CRM ontology as a data set. I used the Claros data set that was published uh, by this institute. So this, for the people who don't know that, uh, it's a uh, data set about arts in ancient Greece and Rome. Yeah? Um, and uh, in this case, so how was the data provided? In this case, I got hold of this data set as an, uh, as an RDF dump. Yeah? So in this case, this data was already published as RDF. Uh, if it had been in other data formats, uh, we would have done uh, basically the translation or conversion of the data set. And then uh, for this data set, uh, I created a couple of uh, templates. Uh, and how these templates look like, you will see. And in, in these templates, uh, I embedded uh, different kinds of widgets for interacting with the data. So these are basically the uh, main building blocks of, uh, of such an application. I also want to explain the role of the ontology uh, in uh, building these uh, applications, in particular in uh, creating end-user-oriented uh, representations of the data. Yeah? Again, I don't want to go uh, into too much technical details, but basically what you, what you see here uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this diagram is that we have uh, linked data graph, yeah, an RDF uh, graph that interrelates or that describes the relationships between the kinds of uh, resources that we're dealing with. So I just had two examples here. Uh, these are actual resources from this very data set. Uh, I don't know the uh, exact people that are uh, involved there and in the, the artifacts that they created, but one uh, example there, so there's an uh, Antonio Paoletti. Yeah? Uh, and that uh, Antonio Paoletti uh, is, uh, has produced an, an, an artifact, it's a, it's a photograph of, uh, of Milan. Yeah? So we have a relationship in this, uh, in this data graph. Now, uh, these uh, resources, they are typed according to this uh, ontology, the CRM ontology. And uh, in this case, this Paolo, uh, uh, Antonio Paoletti is a CRM person. Yeah? But CRM person is a particular uh, concept in uh, the CDOC CRM uh, ontology, and this particular photograph here, it's, uh, it's typed as a man-made object. Huh? Now, the idea uh, of uh, surfacing uh, these resources uh, in the user interface is as follows. Basic idea is every resource uh, identified via URI uh, in this data graph has a corresponding page, a resource page, that uh, surfaces uh, uh, the data. Huh? So uh, these pages uh, in our system can actually be edited as wiki pages. Yeah? So it's very easy uh, end user oriented uh, uh, style of uh, interacting with the data. So every uh, resource has a corresponding uh, wiki page. Now, uh, 
these wiki pages don't have to be uh, created per instance, yeah? so not for every uh, single person uh, in, the, in the database you have to create such a page. Instead, we use a templating mechanism. Yeah? And these templates uh, are associated with the concepts in the ontology. Yeah? So there's, for example, a template for CRM person that describes how or what, what kind of interaction you would like to have with an instance of the class person. Yeah? So basically, uh, what is happening is we uh, check, OK, so what, uh, check what kind of uh, uh, Type is a particular instance of. You apply the particular template and then uh, surface the data. I think uh, I will uh, best. Uh, I here just see an example of some of the kinds of uh, widgets uh, that we have for uh, visualizing, interacting with the data yeah, on visual, the visualization analytic side, uh, abilities for mashups with social media, authoring and content creation, and so on. I'll, I'll show that best in a. Uh, in a live demo, so I will just I will sit down now. I will make the uh, demo hopefully a bit easier. Okay. Okay. Uh, so what you see now uh, is one particular resource page for a resource in this uh, uh, Claros data set. Uh, in fact, this is a uh, a photograph, and uh, this page that you essentially see here is uh, a wiki page driven by uh, a template for uh, this particular uh, concept. Uh, I will just in a minute explain how uh, this, uh, this page is basically surfaced. Before I go there, I show you the underlying uh, um, RDF triples for this particular resource. By the way, uh, up here in the, in the URL, you see the uh, encoded URI of that, uh, of that resource. Yeah? Uh, OK. Uh, if I go here to this uh, tabular view, I basically can see the uh, underlying uh, triples in tabular form. Yeah? So this particular uh, resource is of type man-made object. Yeah? That's, that's this, uh, this concept that I uh, mentioned before in the ontology. It has a label, actually an RDFS label. Yeah? It has a title. It's what it was produced uh, in a production. It has a particular representation. It represents Italy, Mil Milano. It has a number of different types, yeah? gelatine, silver prints, and graphics and so on. So this is basically the uh, raw underlying data that we have. You can also look at this uh, data in, uh, as a graph. Yeah? So basically here you see uh, the same triples represented as a graph. Yeah? So in, in this very center we have, uh, uh, we have the uh, actual resource and then we see here, okay, it's, a, uh, it's of type man-made object and so on. Basically the same, uh, same data here just represented as a graph. Huh? Good. Uh, and this like a more human-oriented presentation. What I, want, what I wanted to, to explain is how this data is actually surfaced. There was no programming involved. Instead, uh, oops. Uh, instead, this uh, page is just created, as I said, by a wiki page. So if I go and edit, uh, I can edit the underlying uh, uh, wiki page. And as I said, uh, this um, particular instance page is driven by a template for uh, this uh, class man-made object. And here you see the underlying uh, wiki syntax. It's actually a media wiki syntax with uh, some extensions that allow you to uh, embed these kind of widgets. So for example, image that you just saw uh, is created by, uh, essentially by a Spark query. I can perhaps let's go to this uh, Spark and edit mode. And you basically see the uh, uh, particular Spark query that goes against the data graph, extracts the image information for this particular resource, and then uh, surface is that, uh, in this case, uh, we have this uh, HTML template surface is that as an uh, image. Yeah? Uh, and same thing for, similarly for the uh, other kinds of elements that you see as well. I completely declaratively uh, described how the data should be surfaced. Uh, as I said, it's not only for visualizing the data, but uh, the uh, data can also be edited then. Yeah? So uh, here, uh, below here, uh, I have a uh, a widget that allows editing of this data via, via forms. Yeah? And uh, if I can now go to edit, well, I actually see that uh, these uh, triples are marked as, uh, as read, read only because I didn't want to touch them. But I can, for example, create new nodes. Yeah? It's a new entry. Uh, this is my node. Yeah? I can make annotations and so on. Or I can give an uh, alternative label or uh, uh, et cetera. Right? So, OK. Um, Good. And this should now also, if I go to node, show more. 
my node actually now shows up in this underlying data graph. By the way, uh, what's also interesting is that we, for every single triple, uh, we manage uh, information about provenance. Yeah? Where do we get the data from? Yeah? It's also very important if we can aggregate data from multiple sources. So if I mouse over this, uh, this eye here, I get uh, information in this case that this actually comes from uh, sources data.clarisnet.org. That's basically the, the name of, or the, the identifier for this particular name graph. Or for the, um, uh, for the node that I just added, if I mouse over there, I see this triple was created by user admin on, or just now, via a particular form. Yes, of every piece of information, I know where, uh, where it comes from. Good. Then, of, of course, I can uh, navigate uh, this graph. Uh, for example, let me go on the page of the creator. Again, this is driven by a particular template where I just said, OK, uh, show me what this, uh, uh, what this person has. Uh, uh, show me his works, what he has created. And here, another kind of widget that shows visually his, uh, his works. Yeah? Uh, again, completely declaratively uh, described. I see a, a visual uh, representation of, uh, of his uh, collection that I can now interrogate. Uh, and I can do that, all, again, based on the metadata that I have for, for, uh, for his works. Yeah? In this case, I just, uh, uh, so this is basically an, an interface for a faceted exploration of uh, such a collection. In this case, I only have uh, three facets. Uh, the location is basically where this picture was uh, taken. Uh, the, what it represents and, uh, and the type. Yeah? And I can now interrogate this, but uh, this is a very small collection. So it's, uh, let me, for example, group by type here. I can now basically have a uh, representation uh, or an organization here by type. I can now drill down if I'm only interested in graphics and so on. Yeah? Um, let me show that on a, perhaps on a little bit larger collection. This is uh, another. Uh, uh, yeah, what we see here in this visual representation is uh, well, uh, this uh, collection of photographs, which I can uh, now look at. Now, these are all uh, photographs from, I, I don't know anything about the photographs, actually, but this is, uh, this is uh, his collection. And here we can uh, kind of a little bit more interesting uh, interrogation. For example, let me group by uh, this collection by locations. All locations is just all the same location, but what they Represent, and then I can uh, drill down by uh, what is represented in this uh, in this uh, in this picture. Yeah? Or I can drill down by again. Let's take the type. Yeah? Uh, drill down by type. For example, if I'm interested in his uh, panoramic photographs. Yeah? So these are the panoramic photographs that uh, that he created. And then obviously I can go to to this uh, to the detail page of uh, of this particular. Uh, man-made object. Yeah? Um, good. Uh, next thing I wanted to show was a little bit on uh, how, how much time do I have left? Okay. Do, do you want to see a little bit more on, uh, on the application side? Yeah? Okay, let me show a little bit about uh, search. There are different ways to support search. Uh, uh, Sparkle querying is, uh, is one thing you can do, and uh, that's not really end user oriented, but, but still I want to show you how to uh, query uh, basically this underlying data graph. So this is uh, a pretty boring query. Let, let me just uh, on the fly create some query uh, just to give you an overview of what's in this data set. Uh, what I'm, the query that I'm going to write is uh, give me all the concepts in the in this data set, yeah, the, the classes that are defined, and how many instances do I have for this class. Yeah? So what I'm going to do is I will count uh, the axes, which are of a particular type, count as uh, count, and I will group by, this is not what an end user does. Yeah? So this is what the Barry or I would do. Yeah, but <laughs> this, is what, this is what I did at the summer school. Okay. Yeah, okay. Just a few weeks ago. Group by, and I will group by type. So this is a large data set. This, this will probably take a couple of uh, seconds to evaluate. By the way, this is roughly 20 million triples that we have now in, uh, in, this, uh, in this data set. Yeah? Um, okay. And now I have a, a basically tabular presentation here. With uh, I can also sort here. So then you see that these are actually the concepts where we have uh, most instances, actor appellations, uh, class where we have most instances, 350,000 man-made objects, uh, and so on. And by the way, also what, what I can do here is I click on this bar chart. Uh, 
and we'll take a second. This will go, give me a, a different visualization of, uh, of this query result. In this case, uh, as a bar chart, yeah. So where where you have uh, basically here the, the various concepts and the number of instances, or you can also, yeah, come on, it's reacting. Or here the same as a uh, as, as a pie chart, right? And these uh, these queries and their visualizations, they can also be persisted in the system. Yeah, I can now, for example, uh, copy either the, uh, this query, yeah, or copy the widget and embed that into another page. Yeah, in, in a wiki page, I just can take the query or take the visualization of the query uh, and persist that. Yeah, and uh, also refer to back to it later. But that's not I'm not going to show that. Uh, I did want to show you uh, search. Obviously, you can also just do simple keyword-based search. Yeah, if, uh, let's search for Antonio. Let me do that. Then uh, I get a, actually, this is a little bit more than just keyword-based search because we really un uh, exploit also the uh, underlying uh, data graph. Here, yeah? What we see in this uh, uh, result set is here now um, basically a list of matching subjects. Uh, the property values, so basically the, 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 the predicates uh, where, where, where I have a match. And the actual, uh, well, the actual property value, yeah. and I also get information about the type, yeah, what, uh, uh, which type information about the uh, matching objects. Yeah? So, for example, this first match here is actually a place, yeah, Antonio, a place, and, uh, and so on. Um, this is the. Well, this is uh, in interesting because I also get information about the uh, underlying metadata, but uh, it's still very simple uh, keyword-based search. We can also do more. Uh, let me just uh, show this, perhaps. Um, and what's also very important is that this, for, this, the search components, as any components in the system, can very easily declaratively uh, specify. Yeah? So for example, what I have here is a widget that supports uh, Semi-structured search. Semi-structured search combining keyword elements with, uh, uh, with uh, structured elements. And this component, I will show you how that is configured in just uh, just a second. But what I can do here, let me start with that. Is uh, again, I can uh, do this simple keyword search. Uh, by the way, you can also uh, see the uh, underlying query that was generated here. That you actually see that it's a semi-structured query that, that was created from this keyword query where I'm actually asking for well, a rank value, uh, subject prop uh, property, the value that matches, and so on. Um, but that's perhaps not so relevant. Uh, the interesting part is that uh, I can now also uh, configure more uh, interesting types of ser searches. For example, I can say, OK, I want to match a particular keyword, but I want to restrict the results to particular uh, types. Yeah? So for example, here, man-made object. Yeah? Or I can could select uh, another uh, concept from the ontology where I want to have a match. Yeah? Uh, this is actually completely driven by the underlying ontology, this, this interface. Yeah? And if I now type for, ask for uh, Antonio man-made object, then I only get the man-made objects. Yeah? So, uh, now, I, I did want to show that this, uh, again, this, this page that you see here is again just a wiki page where uh, the search form, again, is completely declaratively specified. Yeah? So basically, the, the, these parameter names that you saw there, for example, this, uh, this type, yeah, just completely declaratively specified what is it that I uh, want to uh, search for here. Yeah? Uh, actually, there's not much. We didn't have to do uh, much here anyway, because uh, this property type is already defined in the ontology, and I know what, ki what uh, types are, are valid here. Yeah? So this kind of information is uh, exploited in, uh, in the search. Um, perhaps uh, one more thing. Ah, we, we also have uh, interfaces for, uh, for visual uh, query formulation, where you can construct your own uh, uh, interfaces. Uh, your own queries in a, in a visual way, but uh, that just uh, as a side thing. What I do want to show now is uh, exactly the, the, the proof of concept that we uh, did for the uh, British Museum, so search interface for the British Museum uh, data collection, where uh, the idea was to yeah, support an extended uh, type of st structured search where you can uh, dynamically uh, add uh, search clauses, where you can easily configure search parameters, 
uh, and also support uh, alternative visualizations uh, of search results. Uh, one uh, additional uh, technical uh, aspect that might be interesting is that uh, in this particular uh, search implementation, we did not only operate on, uh, on the uh, RDF data graph, but also exploited an uh, additional data index that was, uh, that was uh, managed as a solar index. Huh? So I'm, I'll skip the technical details, but instead just show you the, uh, the search inter interface. So we have that I'm running on a platform that research .org. And in this interface, I can now search for objects, uh, but in a way that I can exploit these fundamental relationships that, uh, that Barry mentioned. Yeah? So for example, I can uh, get this example with Rembrandt. Let's, uh, let's try that. So if I search for Rembrandt, the first thing that will happen is uh, I get a, an, uh, and all the suggestions driven by the underlying ontology and the data, where uh, I also get disambiguation. Yeah? So I can, for example, uh, select Rembrandt as a person. Yeah? So let's do that. So I'm interested in Rembrandt as a person. And now uh, I can uh, select uh, the uh, fundamental relation that I'm uh, interested in. So for example, I may be interested in the objects that are created or modified by Rembrandt. Yeah? So these suggestions actually here, uh, they are made by well, whatever makes uh, sense for this particular uh, object that I have here. Yeah? So I can, for example, say interested in objects that are created by uh, Rembrandt, and I can add additional uh, search clauses, for example, if I'm only interested in the prints. Yeah, I get the suggestion here. Okay, I'm in, uh, I want prints, and I want that these objects are prints. Yeah? So I'm basically I'm asking for prints uh, created or modified by Rembrandt. And let me now do search. And yeah, now I get basically a, a visual uh, representation of this uh, result set that I can then further interrogate uh, using the same mechanisms that I uh, showed before. Yeah? Um, good. Uh, perhaps one more small thing. Uh, so I only, so far I showed the data, uh, but in the uh, system, uh, just so that you also see the, the, the ontology part. Yeah? Obviously, also the uh, uh, ontology can be managed and maintained in, in the system. So currently, I have in the system just, just one ontology, this uh, CRM ontology. Yeah? And see some metadata about it. Uh, there's 94 classes and 299 properties. And if I now click on this, I get a little bit uh, more detail, including uh, human language uh, description, list of classes, uh, properties, uh, and so on. Uh, let me just click on one particular uh, class. Let's take, we talked about materials. Let's take material. Uh, so now I have a, basically a page describing this uh, class material, which uh, again, uh, I can edit. Yeah? I can uh, edit the comment uh, if, I, if I want to. I can uh, change the label. I can change the taxonomic relationships if I want to, and so on. Or I can look at this again also as a graph. Yeah? So you basically see the, how this particular concept is related with, uh, with other concepts in, um, in the ontology. Um, I did have a lot more to talk about, but I think uh, I'll uh, stop here so that we have uh, enough time for, for discussions. Huh? So thanks a lot. Thank you.